Welcome to the Good News Ride Home for Tuesday, June 16th, 2020. Happy Captain Picard Day. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, a new, very promising treatment for COVID-19. Good news for LGBTQ plus Americans. Why people are more honest when they're typing on their smartphones versus their computers. The one man who created the stuffed crust pizza, the McGriddle, the Quiznos Steakhouse Beef Dip, the Dollar Menu, and more. And a Taiwanese airport trying to make a tourist attraction out of all the worst parts of traveling. Here is your daily dose of good news. The world got some good news this morning in the hunt for an effective COVID-19 treatment, or as cautiously good as any COVID-19 treatment news is. A new trial has shown that dexamethasone, a steroid used for various inflammatory diseases, is effective in treating severe cases of COVID-19, reducing death rates around a third of those most ill. Quoting Reuters, the recovery trial compared outcomes of around 2,100 patients who were randomly assigned to get the steroid, with those of around 4,300 patients who did not get it. The results suggest that one death would be prevented by treatment with dexamethasone among every eight ventilated COVID-19 patients, Landry said, and one death would be prevented among every 25 COVID-19 patients that received the drug and are on oxygen. Among patients with COVID-19 who did not require respiratory support, there was no benefit from treatment with dexamethasone. The survival benefit is clear and large in those patients who are sick enough to require oxygen treatment, so dexamethasone should now become standard for care in these patients, said co-lead investigator Peter Horby. The recovery trial was launched in April as a randomized clinical trial to test a range of potential treatments for COVID-19, including low-dose dexamethasone and the malaria drug hydroxychloroquine. The hydroxychloroquine arm was halted earlier this month after Horby and Landry said results showed it was, quote, useless at treating COVID-19 patients, end quote. One factor that's particularly got people's hopes up about this treatment is its cost. Martin Landre, an Oxford University professor co-leading the trial, told reporters in a briefing that, quote, for less than 50 pounds, or about $63, you can treat eight patients and save a life, end quote. Horby added that dexamethasone is, quote, the only drug that's so far shown to reduce mortality, and it reduces it significantly. It is a major breakthrough. Dexamethasone is inexpensive, on the shelf, and can be used immediately to save lives worldwide, end quote. If this really pans out on a large scale, I mean, this could be huge. But as with everything to do with the coronavirus, I have learned to suspend celebrations until we see more. Just days after the Department of Health and Human Services here in the U.S. removed non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ plus Americans when it comes to health care and health insurance, the Supreme Court has ruled that LGBTQ plus Americans are protected from workplace discrimination in accordance with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Prior to this ruling, LGBTQ plus Americans could be legally fired from their jobs on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity in more than half of the U.S. states, a fact that was often underlined after the Defense of Marriage Act was passed in 2015 when many advocates quipped that gay people could get married on Sunday and be fired on Monday. Quoting the New York Times, Tori Osborne, a longtime leader in the movement and a former head of the National LGBTQ Task Force, said Monday's decision was, quote, more important in terms of impacting millions and millions of lives of ordinary people. It's bigger than marriage. It's a watershed, end quote. While there are still many more battles to be won, this is certainly a victory worth celebrating, especially during Pride Month. And to underscore just how long the fight has been going on, I want to read a selection from a letter that activist Frank Kameny wrote to President Lyndon B. Johnson in 1965, a year after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and four years before the Stonewall Riots. Kameny was a World War II veteran and Harvard-educated astronomer who was fired from his government position in 1957 because he was gay. He fought his firing in the judicial system, taking it all the way to the Supreme Court, where his petition was ultimately turned down. 
He went on to be a prominent organizer in the gay rights movement and the first openly gay man to run for U.S. Congress in 1971. Here's the second half of his letter to President Johnson, as reproduced in the New York Public Library's Stonewall Reader Anthology. Quote, Our government chooses to note that homosexual American citizens are homosexuals, but conveniently chooses to disregard that they are also Americans and citizens. In short, Mr. President, the homosexual citizens of America are being treated as second-class citizens, in a country which claims that it has no second-class citizens. The advantages claimed by our country for all its citizens, equality, opportunity, fair treatment, are not only denied to our homosexual citizens by society at large, they are denied at the active instigation and with the active cooperation of our government. This is not as it should be. The right of its citizens to be different and not to conform without being placed thereby in a status of inferiority or disadvantage has always been the glory of our country. This right should apply to the homosexual American citizen as well. At present, it does not. You have proposed and are indeed working vigorously and successfully toward what you have felicitously termed the Great Society. Mr. President, no society can be truly great which excludes from full participation and contribution or relegates to a secondary role any minority of its citizenry. The homosexual citizen, totally without cause, is presently systematically excluded from your great society. We ask, Mr. President, for what all American citizens, singly and collectively, have a right to ask. That our problems be given the fair, unbiased consideration by our government do the problems of all the citizenry. Consideration in which we ourselves are allowed to participate actively and are invited to do so, as citizens in our country have a right to expect to do. We ask for a reconsideration of ancient, outmoded approaches to and policies toward homosexuals and homosexuality, approaches and policies which are unseemly for a country claiming to support the principles and the way of life for which our country stands, approaches and policies which should long ago have been discarded. We ask that on these questions, our president and his government accept and shoulder actively the role properly attributed to them by the report of the President's Commission on National Goals, quote, one role of the government is to stimulate changes of attitude. Sincerely yours, Franklin E. Kameny. Do you ever see an email come in on your phone, read it, and then decide you need to be at your computer to reply to it? Maybe because typing something long on your smartphone is exhausting, or because you need time to craft a more professional response. That latter inclination especially is something that fascinates Shiri Melumad, an assistant professor of marketing at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, who has conducted a study on why we tend to express ourselves more honestly and more intimately on our smartphones versus on our computers. Quoting the Wall Street Journal, in research published in March in the Journal of Marketing, Dr. Melamod conducted three field studies and two controlled experiments. One study looked at nearly 300,000 Twitter posts created in a 12-hour span. Tweets written on phones contained 47% more first-person pronouns and 52% more references to family than those written on PCs, she found. Consumers tend to convey feelings or thoughts that are more private or intimate on their smartphones, which is captured by the use of I or we and mentioning family and friends, says Dr. Melumad. A second study employed 1,380 judges as well as natural language processing software to analyze a random sample of more than 10,000 TripAdvisor restaurant reviews. The software scan revealed that reviews written on smartphones again contained more first-person pronouns and more references to friends, and crucially for marketers, they were judged to be more self-disclosing and in turn more persuasive, end quote. The controlled experiments indicated that one explanation for the intimacy is the small screen size of smartphones relative to computers, which forces people to focus more closely on what they're writing. This is called attentional narrowing. Quoting again, Attentional narrowing is found across online contexts, when we use our phone to tweet, write a review, answer survey questions, even when we're asked to reveal an incriminating activity, Dr. Melamad says. The experiments also further established that smartphones do indeed act as an adult pacifier, psychologically comforting users and thus driving them toward greater self-disclosure, end quote. Now, depending on your comfort level with privacy and more traditional decorum, these findings might have you ditching your phone and prioritizing your computer for all textual communications. But Dr. Melamud emphasizes the positive side of this, 
Because we edit our thoughts less on smartphones, we end up being more sincere. That's her takeaway. Anyways, personally, I feel like my unedited thoughts can sometimes be totally off base, and a little editing helps me be more sympathetic. And while Dr. Millimod focused on how these findings can benefit marketers, I think they can be interesting to be aware of in our own interpersonal relationships online. You know, for example, did someone leave a heated comment on your post? If you're able to see that they posted it on a smartphone, like how Twitter shows you what app or device a tweet was sent on, maybe in your head you can throw them a bone and assume that if you had an extended in-person conversation, they might cool off and think through their thoughts more and you might even find some common ground. I'm not saying you even need to actually have that conversation, just that as mobile usage continues to dominate and therefore our communications online probably continue to veer more personal and emotional, being aware of the possible context of someone's message from the other side of the screen will probably do us all good. It's important maybe now more than ever to find the right workout plan and stick to it. FitBod is the smart fitness app that takes all the guesswork out of planning your workouts. It factors in your goals, experience level equipment, workout duration, and muscle recovery to intelligently craft the perfect total body workout program just for you. It even cycles new exercises into the mix to keep your workouts fun and fresh. I like using FitBod because it personalizes workouts to my body and what workouts I've done, calculating how long my different muscle groups need to rest so I don't under or overwork a particular area. FitBod combines the knowledge of fitness pros with a powerful machine learning algorithm to give you a workout that maximizes your results. You get a program tailored to your unique body, experience, and environment. Plus, you can try one month of workouts absolutely free. Get a personalized fitness plan that helps you work out smarter at fitbod.me slash goodnews. Try FitBod for free for one month when you sign up today at fitbod.me slash goodnews. That's one free month when you sign up at fitbod.me slash goodnews. It turns out that a whole bunch of fast food innovations from the 90s and early 2000s, the McGriddle, the McFlurry, Meat Lover's Pizza, the Stuffed Crust, the Dollar Menu, were all the brainchild of a single man, Tom Ryan. Initially a pre-med student at Michigan State University, Ryan took a food science class at the recommendation of his then-girlfriend and immediately became hooked. He ended up switching to a food science concentration and then earning his master's in lipid toxicology and his PhD in flavor and fragrance chemistry. He spent his early career working at places like Duncan Hines, Folgers, and Jif, and was instrumental in perfecting Pillsbury's frozen pizza dough. That helped him land a job at Pizza Hut as their director of new products in 1988. Quoting, today I found out. Ryan states, quote, working on pizza, I learned two things. That cheese is the most important thing that drives most people's value perception of pizza. The more cheese, the better. No matter how much you put on it, there's never enough. And dogs get to eat the crust because most consumers who aren't bread lovers eat the pizza and then flip the crust to their dog, end quote. Thus, the eureka moment, add cheese to the crust. Like most innovative ideas, as Ryan frequently points out, quote, they always seem simple in hindsight, end quote. But nobody had thought of this rather retrospectively obvious solution to the crust problem, end quote. It ended up taking them a year and a half to get the recipe right. Putting cheese inside of a crust is a surprisingly tricky process, especially when you're figuring it out for the first time. But once they did, it was a hit. Pizza Hut's overall sales rose 10%, selling over a billion dollars in stuffed crust pizzas in the first year alone. And the ultimate mark of success, it started being replicated by other brands and has since become such a staple of pizza choice that I didn't even remember it was originally created by Pizza Hut. Ryan is particularly good at those kinds of innovations that other brands end up copying and thus making a normal part of the industry. He's also the one who came up with the line of meat lovers options, and cheese lovers, pepperoni lovers, etc. After helping introduce all of that, plus breadsticks, chicken wings, and more to Pizza Hut's offerings, Ryan left for a new job at McDonald's. There, he was tasked with improving their breakfast menu. After analyzing the current offerings, his main takeaway was that it lacked anything sweet, a major component of American breakfasts. Quoting again, 
Of course, the obvious thing to do was to add something sweet like pancakes or French toast sticks like other fast food chains would later try. But that didn't really fit at all with what people came to McDonald's for. He states, quote, The big void on our menu was something sweet in your hand. This was key to McDonald's. The product has to fit with why people are using you and why you're valuable to them. We basically took the Grand Slam Denny's breakfast and put it in your hand. And the only little piece of technology we needed was how do you get the syrup inside the pancakes so you don't have to have syrup in one hand, sandwich in the other when driving. We worked hard to figure out how to make those little syrup crystals, and once we had that, McGriddles happened really quickly. End quote. Just like his other creations, the McGriddle was a hit, and Ryan then went on to create the Fruit and Yogurt Parfait, the McFlurry, and even the Dollar Menu. Having put his Midas touch on another major player in the global fast food market, Ryan then moved over to Quiznos, where he introduced products such as the Steakhouse Beef Dip and the Prime Rib Sub, not quite as legendary, but more importantly, while at Quiznos, he met Rick Shaden, one of the owners of Quiznos, and the man who would go on to become Ryan's co-founder in his own restaurant chain, Smash Burger. Their mission was tweaking everything Ryan had observed as going wrong or stale with the fast food industry over the last couple of decades. And it worked. With over 400 locations in nine countries, Smashburger has twice been named by Forbes as America's most promising company. I've been to a Smashburger at least once, and I had a good experience, like the food was decent, but I had no idea that I was treading on the hallowed ground of the creator of so many iconic fast food products from my childhood. I mean, to think that we wouldn't have stuffed crust pizza or McFlurries or the freaking dollar menu without this one man. I feel like his story belongs in a museum or something. In any case, the next time you eat a meat lover's pizza, make your own on some Pillsbury dough, chow down on a prime rib sub, or pull some quarters together to buy nuggets off the dollar menu at 2 a.m., say a little thank you to Mr. Tom Ryan. And finally today, a Taiwanese airport has come up with a way to help people get their travel fix while planes remain largely grounded. Quoting CNN, Taipei's Songshan Airport will give 90 people the chance to take a tour of their airport and relive the experience of going through immigration, boarding a plane, and then disembarking and returning home. End quote. So, basically, all of the annoying parts about traveling without the fun of the trip. I mean... Whatever floats your boat, I guess. The experience itself is actually a competition people will have to apply for. There will be three tours throughout July, and according to airport officials, in addition to experiencing all of the fun and joys of going through immigration and waiting to board a flight, guests will also get to see Songshan's new facilities, complete fun missions, and take home exclusive mysterious gifts. So, it sounds like they're trying to make a unique experience, and I will give them points for creativity, but still, I uh, just can't help but think that maybe they've completely misunderstood what people actually like about traveling. That is all for today. If you want to share any possible stories you'd like to hear on the show or see some of the ones I was considering that don't make it into the podcast, you can follow me on Twitter at JackIsNotABird. As always, I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.